This is a terrible story. The story of how David satisfies his boredom and his lust by taking advantage of a woman he knows is married to someone else. And when she gets pregnant, when Bathsheba gets pregnant, David tries to get Uriah to cover his tracks. The Bible euphemizes it with, go wash your feet. People would have understood that washing your feet meant to lie with your wife. Uriah has too honorable to do as David says, and so David has him killed. It's a terrible story. People have tried to soften it over the years, mostly by suggesting that Bathsheba had it coming because she was bathing on her roof, that she seduced David, which is as classic a blame the victim of sexual violence tale as any I've ever seen, and the scripture does not have a word in it that justifies that. It's just a terrible story. And this is King David we're talking about. This is David who as a boy played his harp to relieve the torment of the former king, Saul. This is David who God chose and Samuel anointed all the rest of his brothers to be king. This is David who slew Goliath with nothing but faith and a sling and a smooth stone. This is David who danced before the Ark of the Covenant as it came into Jerusalem with joyful abandon and wearing very little else. Right? How did this King David get into this predicament? I think we're told by the beginning of today's reading. In the spring of the year when kings go out to battle, David remained in Jerusalem. For decades, every spring, David has gone out at the head of his armies to conquer and to establish and to strengthen his new nation. He did more to expand the nation of Israel in those days than anyone had before. But this year, he doesn't go. I suspect he's too old. Now, So he sends his generals out, and then I think David didn't know what to do with himself. <laughs> As my grandmother used to say, I think he was at sixes and sevens. I think he was anxious about his masculinity, about his ability to keep leading the people, about his legacy. And if there's anything I know about humans, it's that anxiety make smart people do dumb things. And our reading this morning is a catalog of all those dumb things, each one dumber than the last, right? So first of all, deciding that you're going to have someone else's wife, right? Because you're bored, because you're king, and you can get what you want. Dumb thing number one, right? I expect David thought that that would be the end of it, but when Bathsheba tells him she's pregnant, you can just feel his anxiety ratchet up. And so he brings Uriah in from the field to cover his tracks as he washes his feet. And Uriah doesn't do what David asks, and so David gets him drunk and sends him again, and Uriah still doesn't do what David asks until finally, in a panic, I think, about his reputation, David does the worst thing of all and sends Uriah to be killed. Then he marries Bathsheba, and I think he just sort of hopes no one counts too many months before the baby's born. Sometimes they come early, right? <clears throat> Why is this story even in the Bible? I imagine the rabbis... The rabbis who put together what we know as the Hebrew scriptures decided what to put in and what to put out. And being rabbis, I expect they argued. <laughs> and I just imagine some of them saying, I don't know about this story. It makes David look pretty bad. Maybe we'll just leave it out. And then other rabbis 
tugging on their beards, maybe fingering their prayer shawls and saying, no, it needs to be in there. It needs to be in there right along with all of the good things that David did. Those rabbis knew, I think, that our scriptures need to be real, that our scriptures are about real people working out their relationship with God. The scriptures need to be honest about the fact that anxious people makes, or anxious people, even though they're smart, sometimes do dumb things. And I think the rabbis put this story in because in the words of Brian Stevenson, they knew that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. And they wanted to witness to that, the complexity of who David was. I think the rabbis put it in because they also knew that even though our relationship for God runs hot and cold, God's relationship to us is steady. And God stays with us, even when we've done the worst thing. God does not miraculously rescue us from the consequences. And God stays with us and walks us through the discomfort of what we've done wrong and helps us to live into a different reality. And I think the rabbis put this in here because they knew that God designed us to have a grown-up faith. A childlike faith is great, and if we're going to deal with the complexities of our world, and the complexities of ourselves and the people in this world with us, we're going to need a grown-up faith that knows that nothing is as simple as it should be. We're going to need a grown-up faith so that we can see the world and ourselves and each other with clarity, with reality, and see through God's eyes and through God's heart through the dream of what God believes we can be and do. This week I heard an interview uh, with Diana Butler Bass, who's a religious historian out on the West Coast. And she was talking about her ancestry in this country and and, um, in England where her people are from and how she learned not long ago that her ancestors were Quakers. And she was so pleased to learn that because Quakers took a strong um, abolitionist stance against slavery, because Quakers, ahead of most people, were um, clear that women were equal partners in faith. And Diana thought, I come from Quakers, right? And then she did some more research And she discovered that she comes from, and this is her term, bad Quakers. She found out that her ancestors were disbarred from their Quaker fellowship because they owned slaves, and they refused to give that up. She was heartbroken. And she speaks about how she is working to channel that heartbreak into understanding the complexity of her background in ways that work toward health and wholeness. Whenever she can, she tells the story. She preaches about this. She witnesses to her own complexities and invites others to do the same in the context of what God dreams that we could be. My family history is different from Diana Butler Bass's. My people came from Ireland and Germany in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, pretty confident that they were not involved in owning other people. Um, I do know that they were farmers in western Nebraska. And the land that they farmed was pretty much straight up stolen by our government from the Omaha 
and the Pawnee and the Arapaho, the native peoples of this land. There were treaties made, but they were not kept. And those people were driven off their land, often far from the lands they knew and loved, onto reservations to clear out the West for European settlers like my relatives. <clears throat> if my grandparents knew this, they never spoke of it. I don't know if they ever thought about it. My grandparents, or my relatives, I should say my grandparents are great. My relatives, on the whole, were decent and hardworking people. There's a couple exceptions that I'll tell you about some other time. Um, I'm proud of them. I'm proud to be of their lineage. And it's complicated, right? The land that bore them, that is in my blood, was not their land. And my family still owns a farm in eastern Nebraska, and the profits from that farm helped to send my children to college. That stolen land. And in their own ways, my kids are now, as adults, using their college educations as best they can to heal the world in which they live. I'm proud of them. And it's complicated. We need a grown-up faith. We need a faith that knows that people are more than the worst thing that's been done. We need a faith that doesn't just push someone away because they've made a mistake. We need a faith that has a strong enough sense of God's love that we can view ourselves and others with compassion. And we need a faith that's strong enough in our trust of God that we can be courageous and creative and woefully persistent in our search for justice, especially if we're not quite sure how to do that. We need a grown-up faith. When I think about this, one of the things that comes to me is a song by Leonard Cohen, surely one of the prophets of our age. And I think of his song, Alleluia which I believe lives in that difficult and redemptive and challenging place where our human frailties and our longing for the divine come together. You may know the song. It begins with the story of David and Bathsheba. <clears throat> Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her dancing on the roof. Her beauty in the moonlight overthrew you. In later verses, his song talks about how love, that most human and most divine of emotions, is sometimes also the most complicated. Love is not a victory march. It's a cold and it's a broken hallelujah. And the chorus, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise God. And I love how this song, each verse witnesses to pain and complexity and then settles into praise. Even in mourning, even in confusion, even in pain, we praise. Sometimes our alleluias are broken alleluias. They're alleluias all the same. <clears throat> this is a terrible story. I'm glad it's in the Bible because I need the Bible to be real. I need the Bible to witness to what it is to want desperately to do what God wants in the world and to fail spectacularly at it from time to time and how to get back on our feet and try again. I need the Bible to reassure me that God is with us as we seek to 
undo the harm of centuries, because that is the task that is before us right now, especially us white folk. We need that grown-up faith. We need that story of David and Bathsheba and Uriah to remember that we are far more than the worst of what has been done, to face what is before us with humility and with courage, and to know that God goes with us. The last verse of Leonard Cohen's song <clears throat> ends this way. And even though it all went wrong, I'll stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. Sing with me. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia.